Three, two. I got everybody pregnant with Barry Katz and semen. I'm not comfortable with the tone this is taking. If you're undeniable, you will not be denied. If you want to be successful in show business, you get yourself a Jew white manager like Barry Katz. <laughs> Being a manager is just turning no's into yeses. Creating holy shit moments. Uh, undeniable. You fucking firing me up, Katz. I love this man. Is there anything else I should know? You're on. What? Now I'm on the air. Harry Katz. Back in the house. 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 Let's do this. Do this. Ladies and gentlemen, what an honor. I can't believe I get to sit down with him. Rob Morrow. Oh, thanks, Barry. You're so sweet. I appreciate your enthusiasm. I am very enthusiastic. I'm very excited about this interview. And uh, I presume you don't get a lot of chances to sit down uh, on these crazy podcasts because you're so busy. You know, it's funny. More and more, um, you know, everyone and everyone's doing them. So, but... Uh, I'm going to have to start turning them down a little, I think. <laughs> Every time a steel mill closes, there's 5,000 new podcasters. There you go. Um, I have so many questions to ask you, but before we got started, I realized that I started asking you a question that's one of the best questions to ask you. What's that? Because you do everything. You're an actor. You're a writer. Yeah. Okay? You're a director. Yes. You're a producer. Yes. Musician, Tell our, musician. You're a musician. Tell our audience... Songwriter. A songwriter. <laughs> so tell our audience what the difference is for you in all those areas as an artist. Okay, starting with music. Music is, uh, is so inspiring because it, it's such a visceral experience. You can't not be affected by vibrations. You know, if I clap my hands right now, it's going to affect you, right? If I sing a couple notes in harmony, it's going to affect you. If I play music, it's transcendent in a way like nothing else. Um, I can do it by myself. I can do it in front of a thousand people. Um, I have a tattoo here that goes around and around like a Fibonacci sequence, and it's it's a St. Augustine quote. I'm not religious, but it's it's a St. Augustine quote that says, he who sings well prays twice. And so I don't mean that as, that to me that just means you connect to something very deep. One does with music. Um, acting is really fun. It's about play. It's about, you know, as they say, I show, I, you know, I, I show up to work to play, you know, and actors are, and there's a reason for this. They're they're coddled a bit, you know, and they're they're treated like little kids. And they're they're made sure, you know, when I go on a set, people are constantly saying, well, "Do you need anything? You want anything? You want to take a nap? Do you need a few minutes? Let us know if you get anything. You know, whatever you want." It's not just to assuage my ego. It's it's to create an environment where I don't have to think like an adult. So when I get in that fray or sandbox, as I say, I can just play with my other other actor friends, you know, and we can just have fun. And, and that's where great work comes. Directing is the antithesis. Directing is being the adult in the room. You have to make a thousand decisions a minute and someone's constantly in the background pointing at their watch, you know, saying you're fucked. Can we curse on this? Yeah. Yeah. So say, you know, constantly saying that and you have to get it done even though it's impossible. But I've directed a lot of TV. I've never, ever not made my day. But every single day, there's, it's impossible. To, it seems like it's going to be impossible, and I will never make my day. That's directing. Producing is, is about um, fortitude, man. It's like, as you know, it, it, you, 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 can't, you have to have a lot of uh, plates spinning because you never know which one's going to get the, the traction. And then you have to be relentless. I mean, I have a friend who's who remain nameless, big producer. She's got a TV show with a big star. They've been getting the yellow light for like a year and a half, two years. And every time I see her, she's like, oh, it's going, it's going. And and part of me is like, it's never going. And part of me is like, yeah, that's what you got to do. And not only that, but you got to have, you got to have so many of those. Um, there's so many obstacles to bringing work to fruition that, Producing is is takes a lot of patience. Um, uh, writing is is maybe the hardest, but in a way the most satisfying. I just wrote a memoir, and after the once I got it out on 
once I got it structured and out there, um, it became a friend. And so when I would go to work, it'd be like sitting down with this friend and going into this world. Um, but the initial blank paper phase, which I'm in now with another project, as, as you probably know, is really, really difficult. And I think those are all my uh, vocations and avocations. And if you had to rank yourself one through six, I believe it is, what are you best at and what are you sixth best at? Acting would be one because I have so much experience. I've done it so long. You know, it's something that I'm truly, truly confident about in mm -hmm. a good, in, you know, in a good way. Um, uh, producing is the thing I'm least successful with. <laughs> I've done, I've developed so many projects that have not come to fruition. I've developed some that have come to fruition, but, you know, that one is a, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a tough game. Um, so I would say, and, uh, you know, directing probably in music and directing is next and then music and writing. One of the things I noticed about you when I went to dinner with you, with your wife, um, this business is so hard, you know, there's so many things that you have to balance to make successful in your career. And then you go home and you have to balance and create an extraordinary relationship with your partner or else you end up like everybody else in this town. And when I saw you guys together, it was like, it was like this magical feeling that I had seeing you two together that was different than I normally noticed from other couples. Oh, that's so nice. Thanks. It gave me inspiration. It gave me the thought, maybe I won't have to go to women's prisons that much longer to meet women. <laughs> but how do you, what is the secret for you to go through all the stress you have in your career and then to come home and create that extraordinary relationship with your wife? You know, um, I mean, I'm really lucky with her because she's just such an amazing soul and she puts up with my insanity, which is, you know, great. Um, and we've had our ups and downs, you know, we've had to work through it. And um, I come from a divorced family, so I was determined to not go down that road. And I also was someone who was in therapy my whole life, in and out, different kinds, you know. And so... I wasn't afraid to kind of go go into therapy with her at times and and kind of look at look at our issues and do you think it's harder uh do you think it's harder making a relationship work when your parents are divorced or harder when your parents have been together for 50 years where do you think the mo most pressure is you know so often what i notice because i have a 22 year old daughter is part of our evolution as people is to distinguish ourselves in order to create a successful life where you individuate and become your own person. You have to contrast yourself to something. And a lot of times for good and bad, we contrast ourselves to where we came from. And so in my case, I think it benefits my marriage that I came from divorce because I know what it's like to go through a divorce. You know, I saw it young and early and it was dirty and it never got clean. And so, so, um, so I think that's a, that's a big part of it. And I think a lot of people that, you know, come from families that there are successful marriages, some, it's just the thing about a successful marriage is it creates a, a you know, a, 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 a loving kind of sphere, you know, and if you grew up in that, you may just carry that with you. I certainly know a lot of people that come from loving families that went on to create loving families. But the other side of it is, you know, people that I think come from loving families and saw maybe stuff that, you know, there's there's those people that stayed together that weren't, you know, great relationships. And so you see divorce as an option, um, I think. I don't know. I don't know. That's just my story. <laughs> no, it's an important story. T take me through um, what's the thing that's helped you feel comfortable pressing the accelerator and what's the thing 
that's brought you to take your foot off the accelerator? Age. What are the emotions? Age. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't need to as accomplish as much so I can kind of sometimes, and I certainly, you know, I'm super ambitious and motivated, but there's a part of me that can go, ah, you know, I can just enjoy myself. You know, I don't have to go to this party. I don't have to go to this event. I don't have to do that. Um, I think that helps that the other side of that is age makes me put the, push my foot on the accelerator because it's like I only got so much time, you know, which is why I have so many projects going because it's like I have this deep, innate need to express. It's just in my nature. I don't know why or where it comes from. I mean, I can analyze some of it, but in, it's actually just part of my essence. And so there's so much I want to do, you know, and there's so many things I want to do. And so knowing that time is ticking faster, I, I push faster too on that regard. Got it. In your career, to me, like the things that would probably be the most damaging to my psyche would be if I auditioned for a role it comes down to me and the one or two other people I don't get it somebody else does the movie comes out it's like a 300 million dollar movie like that would be bone crushing and I don't know how as an actor somebody goes through that and comes out on the other side better well, for it. I'll tell you, it's, it, it's the opposite in a way for me. If I were in that situation, yeah, initially I'd be bummed I didn't get it. But the fact that I almost got it, <laughs> I could dine on that for a while because usually when it gets to that, there's some little thing is, well, sh the girl's going to be blonde, so we'd rather have someone dark hair. You know, it's it's like, it, it's not, if you're, if it's down to three people, it's not a question of talent. And so, you know, I mean, I probably learned this in the, in my years of really doing a lot of auditioning, but um, if I got close to a part, I could, I could ride that wave. Um, it's possible. You know, especially when I was really starting out, it was like, oh, wait, I could I could get this, you know. Um, and so so the 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 not getting it and it is is almost harder when there's a lot of people being considered because you're like, wait, you got all these people out here and I don't, I don't even get, you know, you're not even thinking about me. You know, that's that's harder for me. In your career. Have you ever been in a mall or just in a restaurant and somebody comes up to you and it's you recognize that the actor and they say, just want you to know if I tested for that role and you were on television for seven years and I wasn't? Um, you know, <laughs> I remember, it's funny, Ben Stiller uh, auditioned for Northern Exposure. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, I, he had a show in the '90s called the Ben Stiller Show. Yes, and, and he asked won me to an come, Emmy Award. Did it? He had me come do a guest appearance as myself, and it was throughout the episode. They cut to me and Ben ch chatting. It was all improv, and and he came up with this whole thing. He said, "Let's do this thing where like it was between you and me, and you got it." And uh, so we made up this whole story. But in fact, I hadn't I didn't even I hadn't even known he auditioned until he had told me. Um, yeah, every once in a while, people tell me they they were up for a part that that I was up for uh, that I got, um, but you know I don't. Uh, it, it, I try to take it all in stride. You know, I just I I feel like a lot of it is luck. You know, so it's it's doing the work. It's as they say, preparation meeting opportunity. But but um, but luck is a big thing, and and no one can define that. Is there any role that you've gotten that after you got it, after you sold them on the fact that you were the person for the job, you got on that set that first day and you were like, as good as I am, I don't know if I'm the person for this job. Well, usually by the time I get on this, every job that happens except 
it's before I get on the set. Really? Yeah. It's before I get on the set. It's when I start the work. It's that blank page I was referring to before. It's like when I'm like, oh, my God, I've got to do this. How am I going to do it? I can't do it. I'm never going to do it. I'm not going to be able to learn all this. I'm not going to be able to know what to do. I'm not going to make it interesting. I'm not going to do I'm not going to be good, you know. And then I get down to business and I work and I work and I work and I work. And the only thing I think that separates me from anyone who started out with me that didn't have success that I did is that I might work harder. And so I work my ass off. So by the time I show up on set, I'm pretty good to go. Like I feel I know what I'm doing. I'm not going to show up unless I know what I'm doing. And that said, every once in a while, you know, I'm, there was a moment I, I wrote about in my book in Quiz Show, this movie I did that Robert Redford directed. And this guy, David Paymer, and I are doing the, the climactic scene in the movie where I nail him and I, I, I show him irrefutable evidence that the show's been fixed. And it was a big scene with lots of layers because it was in a studio, an old studio, and they had the audience and they had the control booth and they had working, every, it was just a big deal. And then he and I in the middle having this chat. And they did so many angles and so much coverage. And it was such a crucial scene that I knew that after a while, David and I started saying, thinking we were sucking. And we both saying, I feel like I'm fucked up. I'm fuck, I can't, I, I feel like it's terrible. And we both started kind of saying that we were both sucking. And we were so convinced that we ruined the scene and might get fired that we walked home. We let the drivers go. We walked across Manhattan saying, I think, I think I'm going to get fired tomorrow. And he was like, I think I am too. And, you know, okay, well, nice to meet you. And the next day was nothing. It was not even an issue. No one even mentioned it, you know, but it was like, so to your point, like, yes, there's, there's doubt that the good thing about experience is you kind of learn how to ride that doubt. So it's very rare that doubt takes me down. Take me back to where you grew up, what the socioeconomic dynamic was, um, what the family was like, and what was your inspiration to getting into this crazy f***ed up business? Um, middle class, you know, um, suburban New York. My parents uh, married young, and 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 their marriage went south pretty quick, but they kind of tried to hang in with, for the kids. By the time it was, I was five, it was pretty much coming to an end, but they hung in for another four years. Um, it was a very idyllic kind of existence on the surface um, with a lot of tension uh, between my mo mother and father. And my dad was, you know, a rager, so he was tough. And I used to go, they used to, I used to hear them arguing and um, fighting. And I would go in there, you know, I was five, six, and I'd take some, like, uh, a, a presence that I, you know, like a rock that I had painted or a wallet that I was gifted and... I'd walk in there and I'd give them, try to bring peace, you know, so I'd give them the, the gifts and then I would do something kind of funny or silly and it had a power, you know, like they responded. And uh, so I think that was kind of the genesis of per perhaps performing. But um, after my parents divorced, um, my dad became... How old were you? I was nine. My dad became a classic kind of deadbeat, like he wouldn't pay alimony, he moved to Florida, became a swinging single. And my mom and my sister and I, you know, we had to fend, we had to fend for ourselves. And all of a sudden we were in a much lower economic bracket. You know, we were, we were, we weren't poor, but we were close to it. You know, we were living in um, a two bedroom apartment, which my mom graciously gave my sister and I a bedroom and she slept in the living room. And uh, she worked as a dental hygienist and, uh, you know, had a tough time with me once I hit teens because I just was a jerk and getting in trouble right and left. She never got remarried? She did twice. And then the third time was a great, really great guy, um, Richard, who passed away a couple of years ago. But um, uh, she, she, made, she, she, she had a good marriage finally. Both of them got married three times. But <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so... You're growing up in that environment, so what's your inspiration to getting into the entertainment business? Yeah, I never thought about it. You know, it wasn't part of, I didn't know anyone in showbiz or anything. Um, and uh, I did stuff, you know, I, I kind of unconsciously was doing stuff like um, 
we would play games in the neighborhood where we would act out TV show. We would play, we would be assigned the character and then, you know, Lost in Space was a show. And I have ski pants and I had a velour shirt and I had boots so I could look like, I made, you know, I would put on that and I got to be the John Robinson, who was the kind of patriarch of the ship. And uh, we would play out these scenarios somewhat. And, um, and then I would kind of find myself, you know, doing little things in camp. I'd run in a spotlight and, you know, just kind of gravitating unconsciously. And then at 15, I was living with my dad. I played the drums. You live with your dad? Yeah. I went to live with him, but I played the drums from an early age, and that was a real, that's kind of what I say is that the essence of everything I do comes down to rhythm. And that was, I, I performed a little bit when I was young, younger with, you know, in bands and school and stuff. But it was at 15, I was living with my dad. I got kicked out of school. I had nowhere to go, so I moved in with him in Florida, and I went to see the movie Grease with my friend Tony, and in the middle of it, I had this epiphany was like, I knew I could never, I was a total, total disaster as a student. And I knew I couldn't have a regular job. I just knew that wouldn't work. And there was something about the fun that John was having um, that just a light bulb went off and I thought I could do that, you know, meaning I could have fun. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and that was it, man. I came out of the movie theater and I said to my friend, I said, you know, I'm going to be an actor. And he was like, I didn't know that. And I was like, oh, yeah. Like I had always planned it. And that was it. I had like this raison d'etre. And before I was 18, I was living in New York City, finding my way. And uh, I believe the first time you were on a major television show was a show that's still on today. I think it's going into its 50th year. Yeah, man. That was, uh, you're right, that was, uh, I had, one of the gigs I got in Florida before I moved to New York was a, I saw an ad for, they needed caddies for a movie. I had caddied for real, and the movie was Caddyshack. <laughs> and I went, and they, I, I, I was there, and the movie went over schedule, and they, they, um, they, all the people that, kids that were playing caddies had to go back to school, but I was like, fuck school. You know, and so I stayed and I became like a mascot on the set. Like all the departments would like take me and show me like I get to change the film and the film bag and then they would put me on the camera and Michael O'Keefe would say to the caterers, you know, he's the star of the movie and 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 they were always putting me in shots and stuff. And and uh Brian Doyle Murray, who's Bill <laughs> Murray's brother, who co wrote the movie, at the end of the movie hands me this little piece of he takes a call sheet and he writes his phone number he said you ever get to new york kid call me up and that was like willy wonka ticket you know that was in my wallet preserved and sure enough it was about two years later i'm in new york i call um uh i, I get through to brian he's up at snl it's 1979 he says uh, come on up and bring some pot i was like okay so I go up there and I didn't even, I thought I was going to say hi, but he was like, we put you in a sketch. Rodney's the host. Did you know that? And I was like, no, I didn't know that. And he's like, oh, we put you in the sketch with Rodney. You're in a jury scene. It's called Substitute Judge. I wrote it. And uh, so I'm just, there's a, I'm one of the jurors. And uh, cut to 14 years later, I'm hosting the show. And I go into my <laughs> Monday morning meeting with Lauren, which is what you do to get the lay of the land. And uh, I say, you know, I was on the show. And he was like, what do you mean? And I was like, yeah, I was, I was, I was uh, an extra on the show. And he was like, get the, Doris, get the footage. You know, they tracked down the footage and sure enough, there I am. And so that became the part of my, part of my monologue that I had been on the show and I had auditioned for this extra and I got this thing and now they liked what I did. So they called me again, you know, that kind of thing. It's uh, one of the greatest things anyone could ever do in their careers host that show it was it was and still is a highlight and you know i was offered a second chance and my agent at the time convinced me to turn it down for some stupid reason which i think was to put someone else in ultimately but um nevertheless it was the the feeling of walking of those doors opening and walking down onto that stage while well, that kick ass it was ge smith at the time and band is playing 
it felt like Mick being Mick Jagger. You know, it was like, and, and, and I was home, I was in New York and I started in that place, you know, it was like crazy. Um, and, and it's a, it's a really gauntlet of a show to do. You, you know, it. the liveness of it is just insane. It's a kind of a theme in my book, these, these synchronistic events that I think are very important for everyone, for everything, not just career, but certainly for careers, but like seeing these signposts, you know, I went on to work with John Travolta a couple times, you know, and that was a signpost to me. That was like, oh, this is the guy that inspired me to my life or, or was a major catalyst. And here I am working with him. That's a sign that I can, you know, as I said before, I can bank on that. I can, I can, you know, you can never get away from insecurities in life and in, and in business and, and in show business. You never get away from them ever. And so when you have these little pats on the back, meaning these synchronistic events, you can, you can use them to bolster yourself against the winds coming, which will always be coming. If there was one moment in time in your career where you had the least amount of anxiety, fear, and self-doubt, what time of your career was it? When was it? It was 90, uh, uh, 95. I can't, I just, quiz show had just come out. I'd just come off of Northern Exposure. I was going to co-star with Sharon Stone in a movie. Everywhere I went, girls just threw themselves at me. Anything I wanted, wherever I wanted, every hotel I checked in, I'd get up upgraded to the presidential suite. It was like everything was going my way. And I didn't even have time to think. I just, but the funny thing is, in retrospect, I thought, oh, this is the way life is. It'll always be this way, you know. Um, but uh, it was fun. <laughs> wow. But it's dangerous, you know. I mean, I'm not sure how I would have ended up if that kept going forever. You know, where it's it's a tricky thing to to get what get what you want. And tell me your lowest point. It was it was fairly recently. It was like it was about ten years ago, and I was kind of just transitioning into different kinds of parts and. I wasn't getting the stuff I wanted and and I couldn't figure out how to move into the next phase of my life. Um, uh, but also, you know, I think in that, as I'm saying that, like when I was really young, when I first got to New York and I was 17, trying to make it in a business I knew nothing about, you know, those first that first year, I basically hibernated. I got jobs, like odd jobs. You know, I worked in movie theaters as ushers, and but I didn't do anything. I couldn't do anything because I had not a dime. I literally would walk around the streets and get half-smoked butts and that. I'd just, then take them home and smoke them. Like, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. And I was, I had some kind of thing that pushed me through, but in retrospect, I was scared, really scared, because I wasn't, I was just hiding in this little apartment, you know, watching TV, Mary Tyler Moore and getting stoned. And, you know, I think that was, that was scary. But, but again, like, you know, I didn't have any other choice but to try to find a path. So I did. Hey, everybody, it's Barry Katz, and I wanted to talk to you about Blueprint for Success. This is a community that I put together during the pandemic to help all artists of every walk of life in the entertainment business, no matter where you are in that part of this journey, it's designed to help you. There are podcasts with people that will inspire you like Kevin Hart, Judd Apatow, Bill Burr that you can't find anywhere else but on this program that I've interviewed to times where we get to talk to executives in the business that you would never have access to, to tell you what you need to hear and to answer your questions, to all sorts of different videos and master classes designed to help you get to the promised land. That's what the blueprint for success is. 
doesn't matter whether you want to be a stand-up comedian, a sketch performer, a podcaster, an actor, an actress, director, writer, social media person, whatever you want to be. I've been doing this for 40 years. I've had the honor and been humbled to represent people like Chappelle, Wanda Sykes, Louis C.K., Dane Cook, and probably over 20 other people who went from a studio apartment to being a multi-millionaire and a household name. And I want that for you. And I wanted to take the time with this program to be able to help you on your way there, to get there and to heighten and increase the trajectory of your career. Blueprint for Success is the way to go. I'm proud to be a part of this program and I'd be proud to have you to be a part of it too. So I, I know how things started going as an actor. How did you get your first director gig? Was it something you told your agency, look, I want to direct something now? Or was it something that somebody just offered you? You know, I had thought, I had studied photography in my time in New York because I had a lot of downtime, you know, and uh, I started, I, I think, unconsciously, unconsciously, I love movies, I love cinema, um, and I, th I was learning to tell a story in pictures, so that was kind of just dating. And then after I was on Northern for a couple of years, I had, I had to fight to get dailies. Like they wouldn't let me have dailies, which was just this dumb old knee jerk thing they have about actors watching dailies. So I had and to, for those of you in the audience who are not in this business, the dailies are the um, essentially the video of every shot that's taken on the camera that day. So you can look at what you did, all your takes. And normally they choose uh, um, the take that they want or the director or the producers will after the script supervisor circles which take uh, they feel is the best one or the director tells them. Yeah, and for some reason they don't like actors to watch them. Every other department comes, you know, used to be used to have invited to dailies on movies they did, but uh, they wouldn't let me see them. And I got it in my contract, so I started getting a copy of the dailies on Northern. So, and I watched them, you know, and I watched them for five years. And so while I was watching them, I was learning about the grammar of filmmaking because I was seeing the different angles and cuts and things. And then I was, I loved cameras. So I would hang out in the camera department. I was playing with the cameras and, and, uh, so I thought I got to try, I got to see if I can get on screen what's in my head. The director, Terry Wiseman, who, you know, had directed, um, three or four things, um, and was a very confident man. Mm -hmm. But um, you've been around directors who've directed hundreds of things. Yeah. You know, you've been around people that have, you know, done everything, have done extraordinary things. And what I thought was fascinating about him, and I don't know because I didn't, you know, I was in, in every meeting with you and him or how it was. But the first thing that amazed me about him was... no fear, confident, uh, felt, believed in himself, yet he was directing somebody who had worked with God. You know, he's yeah. worked with everybody. So you're working with a guy who you know could look at you at any time and say, um, you know, pal, you, you know, you're, not, uh, you're not doing it the way uh, this guy did it. Right. But you never did. But I'm just saying, right. in your mind, as an artist, as a director, you, you would think to yourself, like, am I, am I viable? But you always made him feel like a million bucks, yeah. and you always gave him uh, your belief, and but you also gave him words of wisdom and advice on the side that no one else saw. Right. But, you know, I, I could see from the side or whatever. Yeah. And... It was fascinating, and you, he still, you, even if there was something you didn't like, and there's always things that you don't sure, like, yeah. or you like, or you think you should do things a certain way, 
you always made him feel like you were like, ma'am, you're like one of the, you're like one of the best I've ever worked with. I love you saying that because, you know, it was, I knew he was, you know, he was somewhat green compared to a lot of people that I work with. But when I met with him on video, before I said yes, you know, I could tell that his heart was in it. And I also made it clear that he's got to give me the room to perhaps make it better. I said, I'm not going to come in there and tell you how to do it, but I'm going to offer you ideas and and I'm, I'm going to hope you choose the better idea. If it's mine or yours or his, you know, but, um, and he made it clear that he was welcoming that. So I felt, okay. Um, the thing that, w what inspired me about Terry was I love people that follow their bliss, their dream. And no matter the age, you know, he's not a kid. And for him to be doing this and 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 risking finance, you know, money and um, is a big thing. And so I I just love I feel like no one should ever stop. If you want to be a director at 70, go for it. You know, you, you got to be realistic, but don't not do it. And so my part of my thing was I'm going to help him make have a good time here. I'm not going to be a thorn in his side and question, you know. I'll make sh I'll give him my advice, but it's his show, and and he was very respectful of me. So, but I want to get back to this one question you asked before about before I forget because I think it's a, a good point. When I directed, um, I was got in the deal that I could direct on Northern Exposure, and I had this little epiphany again where I thought, you know, episodic TV is a strange animal, especially back then, and although. Northern Exposure was what I call the cinematizing of television. It It's like, it's very, um, it becomes a machine when you're doing 22, 25 episodes. And I used to joke that my mother could come in here and direct this and it would get done because once a year, someone shows up that's a disaster. They don't know what they're doing and they're a jerk and no one likes them. Like no depart, every department's like talking about them and they're arrogant and yelling and, and you're, and I'm thinking, this is not even going to cut. There's no way they're going to make this work. And inevitably, six months down the line, I'm walking on the street and someone says, hey, you know that episode you guys did with the thing? That was my favorite one. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, that's so crazy. <laughs> and so I thought, I'm not going to do this because I, wanted, I don't want to fulfill what they've already done. I want to see if I can do my thing. And so I made a short, I wrote a short and uh, I made that. And that, that was the beginning that led to me getting directing work. The short was like critically acclaimed. It did well. It got in Sundance and I got, and it was a miracle. I got Pat Metheny to do an original score and um, it got me to direct Oz on HBO. Um, pretty incredible. Pretty cool. Wow. So you bet on yourself you did the short film. Was that the silent alarm? Yeah. Which is available on, on I think, YouTube. Glad the research works. Good job. Um, that out. Did you finance that yourself? Oh, yeah. How much money did that cost? 25 k but I got I got $100,000 out of that. I got because I had all these favors in the vendors and, and the camera companies and stuff and, and labs that we got. We made it for 100. It was really 100 k but it only cost me 25 But I got that back in spades. Yes, you did. Is there ever a show that you direct that you feel over your head? Like, do you feel like I, I, I know I'm a great director, but I mean, this is this is way over my. It wouldn't. It would initially every one. I'm, no matter what it was, I would feel that. But by the time I show up, I've worked all that out, and so so you know, it's all about prep. It's all about being ready. It's all about having a plan. So. If, if I, sh you know, and I've been in crazy situations where the script gets thrown out and the showrunner gets, I was on, I was directing, producing a show a couple of years ago with the script, the showrunner got fired on the Friday before the first Monday of shooting. And it was just like, it was like your captain saying, I'm, I'm out of here. And you're like, well, well, you know, and, and those, situ and, you know, so, but I had a lot of experience at that point. So there was a part of me that was panicking, but there was a part of me that rose to the occasion. But I don't show up um, 
freaked out. I, I have that privately and, and a fair amount. <laughs> it just makes, and it motivates me to work hard. <laughs> One, All right, six degrees of separation. I'm going to mention some names. All right. And you could say a word, a sentence, a little quick story that whatever it is that means something to you. Johnny Depp. Uh, I adore Johnny. Um, you know, we met. We, we screen tested for this movie that we ended up doing called Private Resort. I think it was like 82, 83. And he just had such a, a sweet, distinct, unique charm. And it was way before, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't the movie star yet. So he was different than what you see now. You know, he had an innocence about him. Um, and we became really tight for good couple, good five, eight, ten years, you know, we were, we were really tight and, um, we just hit it off. We got the movie and we ended up going to work in Florida. It was when in the eighties when they were doing all these teen exploitation movies. So basically, you know, we'd show up on the call. She would be Johnny Depp, Rob Morrow and 120 girls in bikinis. <laughs> so that's, when, so that's me and Johnny Depp and we took advantage of it. <laughs> Albert Brooks. Oh yeah. I adore Albert too. You know, um, he, you know, the, the cool, there's something amazing about working with people that you admire first, you know? Um, and I had such a, I was so blown away. There's a great documentary that Rob Reiner did about Albert that's on HBO right now. Um, really funny. It's showing all his early stuff and, and it reminded me of what a genius he was back before he was even well known. Um, but that was, a, that was a, just a great experience. He has a very, he had a very cool deal where he just, you know, they gave him so much money to make these movies and you would just, it would, the t you had all the time in the world. And um, so there was something very relaxed about the set. And, um, and the coolest thing was, you know, they, they, they made me, uh, he was interested in me, but he wanted me to audition. At that point I wasn't auditioning. And so, um, so it was a big deal for me to audition, but I was like, it's Albert Brooks, I'll audition, you know, I don't care. And and they f flew me out from New York. So, you know, they're interested. They're flying me out to, to read with Albert Brooks. So I go there, I go to Paramount, I get led into his office, just a little office like this, and he's behind a desk and we sit down and I have my pages in front of me and we start to go at it and I read like five, six lines. He goes, I want you to do the movie. <laughs> 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 but Orlando Bloom. I liked Orlando a lot. We we uh we did a, a I thought a, an underrated movie called The Good Doctor and um it was really fun. Like he he was so game to be his best and um and and do a good job and I think he was trying to do use this movie to go against type and he was playing a dark character and um it was easy. It was you know there's some there's, Good, good, good artists are, it's, it's easy. You know, I think at, like you, to your point, what you keep saying is like, where's the torture? Well, I think we're all tortured. I can't imagine no one's, I mean, there are a few people, but, but most of us are tortured, but the good ones do it away from the set. You know, they, they have their demons and they wrestle them and then they come to work, you know, to play, as I say. And Orlando was like that. Jerry Bruckheimer. Jerry Bruckheimer uh, produced a series that I did called The Whole Truth. And, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't have that much to do with him or anything, but, uh, but I, he's very, you know, these, these guys that have so many things going on, they're, they're still, they make a point of showing you that they love, they just have a joy for telling stories. And you could tell spending time with Jerry that he just loves stories. He loves he loves telling these stories and being a part of it. And um, uh, I liked him. I would have I would have liked to have done more with him. Marissa Tomei. She's a dear pal. You know, she's my friend to this day, and we've known each other since forever. You know, since I met her when she was nineteen, and 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 we have a theater company we co-founded called Naked Angels with all these well-known artists of, that are now, you know, household names. And, uh, we all started out together building sets and, 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 and 
honed our craft there, got to do parts that no one would cast us in. Some of us would direct, some of us would write, you know, just do anything. And Marissa was part of that. And um, so we've been through so much together and I've done tons of stuff with her. I've done plays with her and movies with her and TV shows with her and um, would jump at the chance to spend time with her or work with her, you know, or both. Kevin Klein. Kevin is cool. He is fun. Um, Kevin, that movie, The Emperor's Club, uh, I think is a, another kind of underrated movie. Um, it's based on a book. And um, he, here's another example of, you know, of watching someone. You know, I watched him on the stage as a young actor, then in the movies. And, you know, going toe to toe with someone like that and holding your own and him his generosity, you know, he had great generosity, he, you know, because they know someone like Kevin knows he's in the power position and someone like me comes on, even though I was well known at that point, but I was, you know, I didn't have a huge part and I wasn't going to throw my weight around. I was going to try to help them do what they needed. And, and Kevin, you know, made sure that I got what I needed in terms of more takes or, um, you know, I love to rewrite and change stuff if, if that's the environment. And, you know, he was very uh, welcoming to my ideas. Robert Redford. Yeah. Well, you know, he was like a, a mentor for, for many years. He was a real kind of father figure and um, gave me advice and um, lent me homes and, and got my movie in Sundance, my short in Sundance. And, um, you know, he showed me what the big leagues are like. Um, and he showed me, you know, the kind of integ how to do it with integrity and um and not let the the pressures get to you you know he just was uh he was he was uh, he was really important in my life because um you know he was the biggest one of them all in terms of like when i, I before i even knew i was an actor i was looking up at that movie screen at his face you know, and internalizing the way he acted, the stillness, the 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 gaze, the, the you know the the the, the quiet, um, you know. So then, to be, I'll never forget when I went to look at the movie the first time. I had to do ADR, Lucas Place. Uh, um, and for those of you who don't know, ADR is when you go in and you're doing your voiceover to certain scenes in the movie. They might want to change a line when your head is turned, something of that nature. George Lucas has this campus up in Marin County that's just incredibly state-of-the-art. And I went there to, to looping is another term for ADR. I went there to loop and, and uh, hadn't seen the movie, so Bob arranged for me to screen it. So I went into this like gold-plated screening room and cush Thing, couch chair, nobody, just me, and I sat in the middle, and I, and I watched myself in a giant screen in a movie, you know, d d beautifully lit, beautifully closed, you know, everything had a purpose in in a, in a palette, you know, it was all, and Bob directed, directing, I was doing stuff that I had watched him do. And he is directing me doing it, you know. So it was just like, again, you talk about synchronicity. Um, he was a that was a that was a real big uh, milestone for my life. Maze. Maze was, you know, that when people ask what's your favorite movie, that's I'd say that because it's not that it's the best, but it it was a true labor of love. My wife co-produced it with me, um, Debonair. And uh, uh, is there I was, a better name in the no world? No better name. Well, tomorrow, who's our daughter? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, uh, I was not supposed to play the lead. Liev Schreiber was going to do it, and then he got a pay, kind of a big paying gig, and had to bow out. So I, and at that point, I had taken so much time away from my other gigs that my agents were like, you know, how long are you going to wait to make, you know, we were talking about producing, you have to, it takes forever to get something green lit. And so I had spent probably a year not taking jobs, thinking I was going to get the green light. And, uh, and then Leah bowed out and I was like, well, I'll just do it, you know? And then again, synchronicity between then and shooting, I get offered a movie to, for two weeks work and, to play a guy with Tourette's syndrome. 
And the guy in Mays has Tourette's syndrome, and I had to learn how to do all those ticks and stuff. So it was like God like saying, okay, if you're going to do it, at least know what you're doing. So by the time, as you get to your other point, is by the time I got to the set, having to produce, direct, star, and write, I was pretty calm. I wasn't freaking out, you know. Sharon Stone. Well, God. Sharon Stone, my memory is, is me sitting opposite. We had these intimate scenes, you know, and I just would be like, her face is just so beautiful and symmetrical, and, and I just would get lost in her beauty. Um, and uh, and she, I thought she did a great job. That's a funny movie because it's called It's Last Dance, and uh, people, I have friends of mine who tell me it's terrible, you know, who say it. And they say it's just not good. It's you know, and and I I think it's a good movie, and I also think it's important movie because it's about um, uh, it's about redemption, which is very important, and forgiveness, and um, and I think it's worthwhile. But but for some reason, people just didn't like that movie. Um, Bruce Beresford, great director. Morgan Freeman. Morgan's great. Morgan just produced this miniseries that I did that's coming out in, uh, sometime this year, next year, this year. Um, you know, when I, when I worked with Morgan, it was on this movie, The Bucket List with Jack Nicholson. And Morgan is just, you know, you talk about someone who shows up, he is as effortless as they come and as comfortable and congenial instantly you know again these most stars are like this i find they know their power they know their intimidation factor i'm not intimidated by actors you know in the fray especially because as i said i'm i already i'm ready to go so and i and i've already figured out all the things that could bother me that i know how to deal with so morgan was just present and fun and easy to work with. And we just instantly got into it. But my fa one of my favorite memories, and with Jack, you're not allowed to bring cameras on the set, you know, so couldn't take your phone and take a picture. But I came on the set. Ironically, don't lose your place. Today, I interviewed the president and founder of Yonder, the groundbreaking technology that puts your phones in the pouches on movie sets in concerts and oh, wow. with comedians. Wow. So anyway, keep going. Anyway, he, he, Jack, Jack would have it on the set for sure. Um, but you're not even allowed to bring the phone on. But um, I, I walk on the set and they called me in, you know, and it was my close up. And Jack and Morgan were sitting on each side of the camera on Apple boxes in their sweatpants. And I was like, oh my God, Jack Nicholson and Morgan Freeman are sticking around to do off camera for me. Like they didn't have to. Which so you know everybody that's, you know, most big stars don't do that. They have somebody else read the lines. Sometimes, but but in this kind of situation where, you know, it they could have it easily could have not. And and uh they both like went back to their trailer, changed, and came back. And like any other yeoman actor, they were sitting on those apple boxes, giving it to me, who was on camera. And that I'll never forget that. And that was one of the highlights of my life, you know. Wow. Segwaying in your proudest moment in show business. You know, sometimes when I've come, I, if I've had a film premiere or something, we come out after it and and knowing, Quiz Show was a big one. When that premiered, you know, at the premiere, it was at the Zeke Field in New York. And... Um, and it was an important movie, or it, so it seemed, and the cultural season had just begun in New York, and um, and all the luminar you know, luminaries and glitterati and 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 dignitaries and um, were there, and so, and I was a big part of it, and so to be in part of being, I was so proud to be 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 of something that was so meaningful. I could say that, but I'm sure I could find other ones. No, it's good. Your biggest disappointment in show business and how you used it to fuel yourself to the next level. One of them is a series I had some years ago that I was going to produce and, and star in uh, that I had with Harvey Weinstein. And um, it, it almost got made and it didn't. Um, and 
it, it, I loved that project so much. So I don't know if it was my biggest disappointment, but I had I had labored on it for so long. You know, I found this guy who was about it's about this doctor in New York, and I I made a film a day in the life, and I sold it to Harvey, and Harvey, you know, for all his terrible qualities, was a could be a great cheerleader producer, you know, like if he was passionate about something, there was nothing like it. And so, and then he got me, you know, he let me choose a writer and I got a great writer and, and, and it was so, I could taste it, not, not taste the success, could taste doing something that had, I thought it was really special and it, and it never happened. Um, and so often, like you, as, as you know, these things die and they die. Like you don't get a second chance. And I don't know why that is, but they do. <laughs> you know, people don't want to chase used goods or whatever, tainted goods. Last question. What advice do you have for the young artist who's growing up in a regular neighborhood, but maybe a broken home trying to figure out what they're supposed to do to get to the next level to the point where they have the kind of multifaceted, extraordinary career that you have? You know, I think the biggest thing is to get to New York or L.A. or London or Paris or wherever it is, you know, Amsterdam, um, and get involved in if it's, you know, I came in through the theater. So my first four, three, four, five years, I did every job imaginable in the theater from cleaning stages to toilets to assistant stage manager to to assistant lighting designer to assistant tech person to understudy to uh, I mean anything uh, that got me in the building so I could watch and learn and see what really happens how this stuff happens and I found my way in some really cool situations in New York as a little baby you know Norman Mailer Tom Horrigan Michael Bennett watching them work you know and I just was getting sandwiches or whatever and like your kids out there and and uh, and I was making so little money. I was making five dollars a day or something, but sandwich, you know, but lunch, you know, and uh, and and it wasn't even like a calculated plan. I wasn't like, oh, if I'll do this and it'll lead to this and that to that. I just wanted to be around it because I loved it. I love show business. I still love show business. And and so my advice to anyone starting out is get around it. If it's the movie business, get out here and get on a lot. You know, Steven Spielberg was jumping the fence and hanging around that lot at Universal until he found himself directing his TV show. Like, get on those, get around it, be humble, be willing to do anything save, you know, harming yourself, you know, and, and, uh, and I feel that if you do what you love and you're doing it because you love it, it will lead to good things. It may not lead to exactly what you want or fantasize about, but it will lead you somewhere good. And so do what you love. Awesome. Rob Morrow, I am so grateful that you came oh, today. And this pleasure. has been an unbelievable interview. So inspiring. Thank I'm you so much, so. brother. Thanks. Yeah, my pleasure. Man. I appreciate it. I just it. want to say I really, your presence is um, is is such a warm and and uh, and Pat and and you know you're you're a great producer in that you make people feel good about what they're doing, and whenever you showed up on set, I had a good vibe about you, and uh, and so I appreciate what you do too. Boy, coming from you, man, I feel like I'm wearing clown shoes when I'm sitting across from you. And well, you got from some you. pretty long shoes on there, my <laughs> friend. Yes, I do. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah.